In June 2015, 46-year-old Dr. Teresa Severs had been visiting her family in upstate New York with her husband Mark and their two girls, aged 8 and 11. But Teresa had left them to enjoy a few more days and had caught an earlier flight back home to Bonita Springs, Florida, so she could go back to work. Mark, her husband of over 10 years, stayed with the girls. He was used to his wife's career and proudly supported her. Teresa was a holistic physician who ran her own medical practice. She combined her knowledge of Western medicine with a respect for Eastern medicine to successfully treat her patients with a blend of traditional and alternative methods. Teresa was a compassionate healer, but she was outgoing and always pushed for what she believed in. Teresa is seen on surveillance video after landing at Southwest Florida International Airport on Sunday night, June 28, 2015, ready for her patients the next morning. But her colleagues were very surprised when the doctor didn't show up. It was unheard of. Teresa Seavers never made it to work the next morning. They called her and Mark, but nobody could reach her. Then a visit to her home revealed Teresa had made it back to the house that night, but had never left. Investigators believe that as soon as she walked into the kitchen of her Bonita Springs home, she was killed. She was found dead in a pool of blood on the floor with a blood-stained hammer beside her. She'd been hit with the weapon at least 17 times, crushing her skull and causing devastating injuries. The Seavers family had set their home's security alarm before leaving on their trip. But police suspect the alarm was disabled by the intruders on the morning of the day she was attacked in her home. Physical evidence was collected from Teresa Seavers' kitchen. Investigators believed she'd arrived home from her flight, had walked into the kitchen, and been attacked. Had Teresa interrupted a robbery? There were signs of a forced entry, pry marks on a side door. But confusingly, cash and valuables in the house hadn't been taken. Investigators discovered $40,000 and a large gun collection stored inside a safe in the Seaver's home had not been touched. When word of Teresa's death became public knowledge, other theories started to circulate. There were reports of other alternative doctors dying in suspicious circumstances in the U.S. Were they connected? Police also turned their attention to patients who might have had an issue with Teresa, whose focused determination could sometimes come across as abrasive, but any leads came to nothing. Mark Seavers was acting very oddly for a man who had just lost his wife. The day before her funeral, he was at the beach, inviting people back to his house for a pool party. And he was cold when people tried to comfort him. Everyone assumed the shock was making him act out of character. Everyone grieves differently, and Seavers had been miles away at the time, so any suspicions that he'd played a part were quashed. Then, acting on a tip-off, police started to investigate Curtis Wayne Wright, 51, a man who lived 1,000 miles away in Missouri, and coincidentally had an uncanny resemblance to Seavers. He'd rented a car that weekend, and the GPS showed he'd driven to Florida, specifically to the Seaver's house. He hadn't traveled alone either. Wright had made the trip with Jimmy Ray Rogers, 29, a man who had given himself the nickname Jimmy the Hammer Rogers. They'd met while in prison together. Wright was inside on drug charges and Rogers was doing time for weapon charges. Both men were arrested for Teresa's murder. But why did two men drive 1,000 miles to kill a woman? Seavers and Wright had grown up together in Missouri and had remained best friends all their lives. Wright had gone to Teresa and Mark's wedding and had even attended Teresa's funeral. Wright had done some work on the computers at Teresa's clinic and Seavers had been best man at Wright's wedding. There seemed to be no reason why Wright would take a violent friend on a road trip to murder his best friend's wife. Was Wright jealous of the Seavers family? How had they known Teresa was alone that day? Or was the whole family the target? The evidence was slowly pieced together, and police believed they knew what had happened. On the morning of June 27th, Wright had picked up a rental car and Rogers, and had driven 1,100 miles to Bonita Springs. They had driven all day and all night, 
and arrived at around 6 a.m. on Sunday, June 2015. GPS showed they had arrived at the Seavers' home. Police believe the two men entered the house, disabled the security alarm, and then got back into the car for another ride. They went off to a local supermarket and were seen on CCTV, buying trash bags, wet wipes, black towels, and a lock picking kit. Following the shopping trip, the GPS recorded a drive to a local beach. Then they returned to the Seavers' house and waited in the garage for Teresa to return. GPS showed they drove the 17 hours back to Missouri in the early hours of Monday morning. A motive was still undetermined. But then, after initially denying being involved, Wright started talking. He admitted he and Rogers had killed Teresa. The reason? Because Seavers had told them to. It had all been his idea. More probing revealed that Seavers and Teresa were having marital problems along with some serious financial issues. There were several life insurance policies on Teresa's life, totaling over $4 million. Wright said Seavers had promised to pay him $10,000 to kill Teresa in a sickening murder for hire scheme. Seavers was arrested and it sent shockwaves through the community. Once Wright started talking, he wouldn't stop and he brought the whole plot down. He made a deal and was allowed to plead guilty to second-degree murder if he testified at Seavers and Rogers' trials in return for a lesser sentence. First to face trial was Jimmy Rogers in October 2019, and Wright was the star witness. When asked who had killed Dr. Seavers, he replied, I did, and Jimmy Rogers. Wright said he hit Teresa three times, and then Rogers had taken the hammer and continued to hit her over and over again. The motive was the money that Seavers promised them once the job was done. A blue jumpsuit was discovered on the side of Highway 47 in Missouri. Fibers from the jumpsuit matched the fibers found on Teresa Seavers' dress. Jimmy Ray Rogers' girlfriend, Taylor Showmaker, would later tell investigators he took her for a ride along Route 47 in rural Missouri. And along the road, he asked Showmaker to throw out parts of his cell phone, which he had smashed earlier, some gloves, and the blue jumpsuit. Seavers didn't testify, but his lawyers said it was Wright who had beaten Teresa to death and that his word couldn't be trusted. Curtis Wright's the only one that ever hit that woman, and he's lying to you to save his own worthless skin, they said. Jimmy didn't have a hammer. But the jury found Rogers guilty of second-degree murder, and he was sentenced to life in prison in 2019. Next to face a jury was Seavers. Wright was there to testify against his former best friend, who he referred to as his brother from another mother. Jimmy Rogers and I physically did it, but Mark Seavers was also involved in the planning. Wright told the court, adding that it was planned by Seavers because he had money problems. He believed Teresa was planning on leaving him and would take the kids. Wright said Seavers told him having his wife killed was the only option. Seavers was found guilty of first-degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder for his role in the plot to kill his wife. In January of 2020, Seavers made a statement at his sentencing saying he was innocent and heartbroken, adding that Teresa was his soulmate. Although a jury found me guilty, I am innocent of all charges, he said. The judge told him, I judge people's actions. I don't judge people's souls. That's for somebody else to do. He then sentenced Seavers, 51, to the death penalty. Wright received his 25-year sentence in February of 2020. I wish that there was a way, anything at all I could do to change what happened, he said. I can't, and it will be with me for the rest of my life and I'm truly sorry. For Teresa's family, it had been a long five-year wait for justice, but the pain of losing Teresa was just as raw. Marianne Groves, Teresa Seaver's mother, made a victim impact statement about her extraordinary daughter, who was making a difference in the world, and spoke of the lives she'd left behind. My granddaughters have broken hearts that will never be mended, Mary said. They will spend their lives hoping to hold on to the memories of their mother they once knew, and trying to forget the nightmare she endured in the last moments of her life. 
While Teresa's mission was to save lives, her husband hired his best friend to end her life. Loretta Saunders, 26, was discovered dead on a median off Route 2 of the Trans-Canada Highway in New Brunswick, more than 450 miles from her hometown of Halifax. Saunders, a criminology major in St. Mary's University who had written a thesis about missing and murdered Aboriginal women, was last seen February 13th on her way to collect rent from her tenants. Law enforcement officials said they have ruled Miss Saunders' death a homicide and have identified the suspects in her slaying. The victim's two tenants have been previously arrested in Ontario, some 2,000 miles from Halifax, for allegedly stealing Saunders' car. According to a statement released by police, Saunders' remains were found at around 4.30 p.m. in February 2014 off a road west of Salisbury. Police are not saying if Blake Leggett and Victoria Hennenberry, who have been renting Saunders' apartment, will face charges in her murder, but officials said they are not looking for any other suspects. Both Leggett, 25, and Hennenberry, 28, have been extradited from Ontario back to Halifax to face charges of theft of vehicle. Miss Saunders was last seen alive on surveillance footage, leaving the Halifax apartment she started renting to Hennebury and Leggett in January 2014, just six days after her February 13th disappearance. The couple were busted over 2,000 miles away at a friend's house in Harrow, Ontario with Saunders' car and debit card. Yalkin Circleté, Saunders' boyfriend of two years, was the last to see the three months pregnant woman who just recently finished her undergraduate thesis on Aboriginal women who had gone missing or were murdered in Canada. The two were living together after she started renting her own apartment in a high rise building to help cover school expenses. But Saunders had been having a hard time collecting $700 in rent from the tenants she met on classified site Kiji. So she was going to get the funds in person she went to get her rent Thursday and said if they didn't have it, she'll tell them they have to leave. Her brother Edmund Saunders stated. When she got there, they weren't home. She phoned them, apparently, and told them they had to leave. That was the last time she was seen in person. CCTV footage caught her, leaving the building, and it doesn't seem like she was followed. At one point, her boyfriend received a bizarre text message saying she had locked herself out of her online banking account and couldn't remember her mother's maiden name to unlock it. Saunders also had a suspiciously short text message conversation with her sister on Friday, and then ceased all contact. Saunders was officially reported missing February 17th, when she went a long time without contacting her father. The following evening, authorities tracked down Hennebury and Leggett, more than 2,000 miles away, staying at a friend's house in Harrow, Ontario. They had driven there in Saunders' blue 2000 Toyota Celica and had been using her debit card since the day she went missing. The couple were arrested on charges of possessing a stolen vehicle, but they were also discovered to be fugitives in other provinces on unrelated charges. Leggett had an outstanding warrant for not appearing in Calgary court, while his girlfriend Hennebury was wanted for threatening someone in Halifax in 2011. Originally from Hopedale, Newfoundland, Saunders was an aspiring lawyer who spent the last three years studying sociology and criminology as an undergraduate at St. Mary's University. Her brother said she was excited to become a mom for the first time but her past also seems to be marked with hardship. She was a recovering drug addict and was on a methadone treatment program. The family of Loretta Saunders burst into applause as a Nova Scotia judge sentenced her two killers to life in prison in April 2015. Blake Leggett and Victoria Henneberry entered guilty pleas to first degree and second degree murder, respectively. Judge Josh Arnold told Blake he must serve 25 years before he can apply for parole, which is the mandatory sentence for first-degree murder. The judge told Victoria she must serve 10 years before she can apply for parole. Arnold said the despicable, horrifying, and cowardly murder left the Saunders family crushed.
brokenhearted and empty. The treachery of Mr. Leggett and Ms. Henneberry have polluted so many lives, Arnold said. Loretta's sister lunged and swore at the pair, who admitted to murdering the St. Mary's University student. As emotions ran high during the family's reading of victim impact statements, during a sentencing hearing in Halifax's Supreme Court of Nova Scotia. First-degree murder carries an automatic life sentence with no eligibility for parole for 25 years, while second-degree murder carries a life sentence and no eligibility of parole for between 10 and 25 years. In addition to the automatic life sentence for Leggett's first-degree murder conviction, the Crown had asked for a DNA order and a weapons ban. The Crown and Defence made a joint recommendation that Henneberry serve 10 years before applying for parole, the minimum allowed. When the pair pleaded guilty, Leggett confessed that he attacked Saunders, choking her and slamming her head into the floor. Once he subdued her, he wrapped her head in plastic. Henneberry watched the killing and failed to stop it or call for help. Leggett and Henneberry then placed Saunders' body in a hockey bag and carried her out of the apartment. They dumped her body alongside the Trans-Canada Highway near Salisbury, New Brunswick, where she was discovered two weeks later. The grief-stricken parents of a young woman who took her own life after being tricked into a fake relationship by her best friend have vowed to seek justice for their daughter. Teresa and Mark Marsden's lives changed forever in August of 2013, when their daughter Renee, 20, killed herself after she was catfished online for 18 months. The Sydney hairdresser had received a message from who she thought was her boyfriend Brayden, Spitery, who told her their relationship was over. In an inquest into their daughter's death, it was revealed Brayden had been a fictional character invented by her best friend, Camila Zidon, the man whose photos were stolen and used in the deception. Carpenter Cameron Lang appeared alongside the Marsdens on SBS's Insight program. The show explored the consequences of being a victim of catfishing and the motivation behind the virtual deception. Mr. Lang revealed the destructive impact having his identity used to fuel the fake relationship has had on him, leaving him a recluse because of the scrutiny he faced for being associated with Renee's death. Mrs. Marsden broke down as she described the heartbreaking final text message she received from her daughter just hours before she died. She said to me that she loved me and that she was sorry for what she was about to do and that I needed to look after the rest of the kids in the family," she said. The couple explained their daughter had begun communicating with a person she thought was Brayden in 2011, after Camila introduced the pair. Only two months later, Renee received a message from Brayden telling her he was going to jail after being involved in a motorcycle accident. He said his friend had died in the crash, and as a result, he was being charged with manslaughter but the couple decided to continue their relationship. Renee's mother said she disapproved of the pairing, revealing Brayden would also send her not-so-nice messages, but wanted to support her daughter. I hated it. Renee and I had a very close relationship, so I supported her in whatever she wanted to do, she explained to host Kumi Taguchi. I wanted her to still be open with me, so I listened to what she had to say. While her parents hoped she would find someone new while Braden was behind bars, the relationship intensified. After police returned their daughter's phone, the couple found about 30,000 messages between her and the man she thought was to be her future husband. Renee's father Mark said he had rung a few of the numbers saved on the phone and had even been connected with a wedding photographer. It was revealed the couple had been in touch with the consulate to find out if Brayden could travel overseas for their honeymoon with a criminal record. Taguchi asked the couple if their daughter had ever tried to pull away from Brayden, as he became increasingly controlling. Every time she tried to pull away from him, his mum was dying of a brain tumor. So that pulled her back, Mrs. Marsden explained. He was bashed in jail. It pulled her back. Every time she decided to pull away, there was always something happening in his life that made her feel sorry for him. 
In August 2013, about 18 months into what Renee had believed was a real relationship, she came home from work and said Brayden had ended things. While she insisted everything was fine, texts Mrs. Marsden received from her daughter's ex-boyfriend suggested otherwise. Brayden told her to sort her daughter out because she was threatening to take her own life, but Renee was able to convince her mother she was fine. She then received the crushing text from her daughter, apologizing for what she was about to do. Renee was then reported missing and police discovered her car a few days later. Mrs. Marsden said the family banded together during the excruciating wait for a body, adding that Camila had attended the intimate gatherings. She and her husband started to suspect something wasn't quite right after the phone number Camila provided for Brayden went unanswered. They pushed for an inquiry into their daughter's death, which determined it had been Camila who had tricked Renee into an online relationship. She was granted immunity in order to give evidence at the inquiry in February 2020, where she claimed she had also been in a real-life relationship with Renee. She told us that they were in a relationship and we would not accept the fact they were together, Mrs. Marsden said. Camila was obsessed with Renee. She couldn't have her as a female, so she created the male. The coroner concluded there was no evidence Renee and Camila were romantically involved and declared Camila's evidence was nothing but a pack of lies. Police have never laid charges against Camila, despite multiple interviews, statements, search warrants, and a thorough police investigation. Mr. Marsden said the couple had started a petition calling for catfishing to be made illegal in Australia, which already had 10,000 signatures. He said thousands of people had sent them messages explaining how they had been similarly deceived since hearing of their daughter's tragic story. Renee was manipulated. She was deceived. She was lied to. She was controlled. It was coercive. Morally, ethically, it doesn't matter. It should be illegal now, he said. The deception of Renee Marsden also changed Mr. Lang's life forever after Camila stole his identity. The 33-year-old said he had been shell-shocked to hear Renee had taken her own life and quickly became a recluse because of the looks he would receive in the street. Mr. Lang said members of the public wrongly thinking he was responsible for Renee's death would glare and judge him. Despite this, he and the Marsdens have been able to bond over the trauma of Renee's death and regularly keep in touch. The carpenter said it was important for him to have a relationship with the couple because there were few who would ever understand how he feels. Mrs. Marsden said, despite seeing his face in a photo frame on her daughter's nightstand for 18 months, Mr. Lang was now part of the family. On December 23, 2006, Waller was the victim of a violent break-in at his house that left his girlfriend dead and him seriously injured. In Waller's tale, there are both tragic elements and accusations of unfairness. Waller didn't end up being the victim. Instead, he was one of the key suspects in the unfortunate incident that resulted in the death of him and his girlfriend. He was well known online for being the subject of a lengthy police interview conducted while he was still battling with the two headshots. In the end, his case had both civil rights cases of abuse and police misconduct, including the fact that they failed to treat him soon away and ignored his brain damage for several hours. The case is also infamous for having a lot of false information. There were a number of theories and complaints that the police didn't treat Ryan fairly and that there was more to the story when numerous unrelated persons and the media performed follow-up interviews with Ryan's family and friends. Heather and Ryan used to live together in a rented apartment with a roommate, Alexia. She was not home that day, though. The late couple had only been residing in the home for roughly one and a half months. On the afternoon of December 23, 2006, Ryan and his girlfriend were sitting in the living room or in their room when Richie Carver, Larry Carver's son, and him arrived at Waller's door. They rang Waller's doorbell when they got there, and Ryan came over to see who it was. Nevertheless, 
Carver and his son broke into Waller's home. When Waller tried to shut the door, Richie put his arm inside and shot Ryan twice in the head, assuming that he had died. After that, he killed Heather, Ryan's girlfriend, by shooting her as she sat on the couch in another room. Because the father-son team didn't want any witnesses, Richie allegedly killed her. After the shooting, Richie and his father also seized some weapons and a computer from the site. The subject of numerous theories is why Larry and his son attempted to kill Waller and his girlfriend Heather. When Waller and Larry's son, Richie, were roommates in the past, their disagreements lasted for a while. Ryan and Richie had also previously engaged in physical conflict with one another. Some others claim that Richie made approached Heather, Ryan's girlfriend, which he found offensive. On the other hand, there were rumors that Richie and Waller engaged in a gun-toting altercation. Some claim that Richie was merely envious of Ryan's nice possessions. It was close to Christmas, so it was anticipated that Ryan or Heather would have called or come by to celebrate the holiday. Three days later or so, Ryan's father started to worry because he had not heard from his son in a few days. Ryan's parents drove to his house after receiving no call from him for two days. They rang the doorbell and peeked from outside, but no one answered. His father called the police when he didn't hear back from them. When the police arrived at the flat, they discovered Heather Kwan dead. However, Ryan Waller was amazingly still alive and moving around the property despite being shot in the head and having his girlfriend's body lying around. Waller reportedly refused to speak with the police, claiming he didn't remember what had happened. His actions complicated everything, leading to the police holding him and interrogating him for hours about the incident. During the investigation, when police called out the name of Richie Carver, surprisingly, Ryan was able to identify him and his father as the shooters. According to the authorities, Ryan had various wounds on his nose and cheeks and a severely swollen black eye. Through vertical blinds, the cops eventually discovered the dead body of Ryan's girlfriend, Heather. They quickly handcuffed the injured Ryan and led him to their vehicle. Ryan's parents, Don, and his wife could not meet their son because of the cops. In addition, they could not take their son to the hospital. After being taken into custody, Ryan spent several hours in the patrol cars without receiving any medical care. Ryan was brought to the questioning station the following day at around five in the morning. Even though there was an apparent injury to his left eye, the police did not believe Ryan was shot in the head because they thought he was the one who killed his girlfriend. The police refused to give Ryan timely medical assistance because they didn't believe him. His condition had worsened by the time he would eventually obtain medical attention. While still hurt and in pain, Waller was questioned by Detective Paul Dalton. Ryan said little during the interrogation, other than that he wanted to sleep. Then, the police inquired about Richie and other topics. Ryan reportedly refused to reveal that he had killed Heather, despite the detective's attempts to get him to do so. Ryan didn't get hospital treatment until after several hours of interrogation. Later, the police notified his dad, Don, that his son was in critical condition. According to what the physicians allegedly told Don, Ryan's father that the absence of prompt medical assistance caused the infection. It took 35 days for Waller to heal in the hospital. Ryan lost a portion of his brain during the recovery process. Ryan's left eye was permanently lost, and even after leaving the hospital, he experienced seizures for a number of years. After Ryan identified Richie and his father Larry for the shooting, the cops detained Richie almost a week after Ryan Waller left the hospital. Richie's mother handed his father, Larry, in the following week. Richie had his sentence handed out first. Richie Lee, Carver's son, was found guilty five years before his father was, in 2008. He was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Richie was found guilty by the police of felony murder, burglary, aggravated assault, and weapons misconduct, because Larry's wife declined to testify against him under the guise of her marital rights. The court was initially unable to indict him. 
Richie's mother was required to attend court after Heather's family successfully lobbied for the repeal of the privilege, as mentioned above in a later rule. The court re-indicted Larry in November 2011 for first-degree murder, first-degree attempt murder, burglary, and aggravated assault. When a Maricopa County jury found Larry Lloyd Carver guilty on multiple counts in connection with the 2006 murder of Heather Kwan, the case reached its conclusion. The jury also determined that Carver was responsible for her lover Ryan Waller's attempted murder. On January 25, 2013, Carver was sentenced to a potential life sentence in prison following a 10-day trial. Some claim there was no parole. Don, Ryan's father, sued the Phoenix Police Department in Arizona a few years after Richie and Larry were sentenced to prison. Don said that the police provided false information regarding the day of the shootings. Ryan's interrogator, Detective Dalton, was also charged with tampering with the evidence and fabricating stories about the case. Dalton reportedly had a contentious professional background, particularly in handling his former cases. In the past, he had put blinders on the incorrect individual and broken the law to end a case. For the manner they handled Ryan's case, it is assumed that Phoenix Police Department is currently under investigation. Even the U.S. Department of Justice contacted the officials handling Ryan's interrogation. No one knew for sure what a difference an hour could have made, because he had been in the apartment for nearly three days before the police arrived at the crime scene. If the cops had responded quicker to get Ryan Waller medical attention, it's unclear if his life may have been saved. When Ryan first went blind, he had to rely on his parents to get by. Later, he would start having seizures, which would eventually cause his death in January 2007. A quiet spring night in Kansas City's historic Hyde Park in 1988 was shattered when a man wearing nothing but a dog collar around his neck leaped from a second-story window of a Robert Burdella's house, where he was being held captive. He crashed to the ground and ran to a nearby meter maid, who called the police. Police secured a search warrant and proceeded to discover a cavalcade of horrors inside this unassuming house. Opening a second-story closet, they discovered a human skull, as well as human vertebrae, marked from where they had been cut with a bone saw. In the backyard, they discovered another human head buried in the ground, partly decomposed. When they ventured into the basement, they found large barrels stained with blood, as well as the personal belongings of two missing people and a stack of Polaroid photos depicting naked men being sexually assaulted and tortured. They also found a stenographer's pad meticulously detailing the abduction, torture, rape, and murder of six young men from around the area. This house, 4315 Charlotte Street, belonged to the Kansas City Butcher, one of the most deranged serial killers in history. Born Robert Andrew Burdella Jr. on January 31, 1949, in Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio, the man who would become this terrifying killer grew up in a deeply religious Roman Catholic family in the early 1950s. From a young age, Robert Burdella was a loner. With his severe nearsightedness, high blood pressure, and speech impediment, he was an easy target for bullies in his neighborhood. This included his father, who would physically and verbally abuse the young boy for his lack of athleticism. However, by his mid-teens, Burdella had begun to gain some confidence. He had realized that he was gay, and though he kept this a closely guarded secret, it gave him a level of self-assurance. This confidence manifested itself in a rude and condescending attitude, especially towards women, that he would hold for the rest of his life. In 1967, Robert Burdella graduated from high school and started attending the Kansas City Art Institute. In college, he was finally able to express himself and was open with his homosexuality. Though he displayed artistic talent, he quickly got caught up in drug use and low-level drug dealing. It was also during this time that he began torturing and killing animals. 
After he received harsh backlash from the administration of the Institute for an Art Piece, where he tortured, killed, and cooked a duck, Berdella left college and moved into a house in the Hyde Park neighborhood of Kansas City, Missouri. Using the contacts he made through his extensive pen pal relationships from his lonely childhood, as well as his knowledge of art, Berdella opened a store called Bob's Bazaar Bazaar, where he sold art, jewelry, and antiques from around the world. Throughout the 1970s and early 80s, Robert Berdella spent much of his time with male prostitutes, drug addicts, petty criminals, and runaways that he claimed to be mentoring. In reality, he was engaging in manipulative sexual relationships with young men. Berdella used his money and influence to create an imbalance of power in his relationships he would use to control these young runaways, many of whom had been prostitutes or had been sexually abused. Then, in 1984, the Kansas City butcher claimed his first victim, Jerry Howell. Howell was the 19-year-old son of Paul Howell, one of Berdella's acquaintances from his art-dealing business. On July 5th that year, Berdella offered to drive the young Howell to a dance competition at a neighboring town. On the way, Robert Berdella plied the youth with alcohol and then drugged him with Valium and Asipromazine. He tied Howell to his bed for 28 hours, during which he repeatedly drugged, tortured, raped, and violated the youth with foreign objects. Ignoring his desperate pleas for Berdella to stop, he continued his torture until Howell finally asphyxiated from a combination of his gag, the drugs, and his own vomit. After Howell died, Robert Berdella butchered his body leaving the corpse upside down overnight with cuts in major arteries to drain the blood and then dismembering the body with a bone saw. He then placed the pieces of the dismembered body in separate garbage bags along with assorted other trash and left them out on the curb for garbage men to take away. Throughout this process, Berdella kept detailed notes of how he raped and tortured Howell on a stenographer's pad something he would continue to do for all his victims. His next victim was one of the drifters that Berdella had taken care of and exploited for years, Robert Sheldon. The 23-year-old man arrived on Berdella's doorstep on April 10, 1985, begging Berdella to let him stay there. Berdella was not attracted to Sheldon, and though he did not rape him, he did restrain and torture him. With Sheldon, Berdella began his experiments on using chemicals to weaken his victims, leaving them helpless to his machinations. He bound Sheldon's wrists with piano wire in an attempt to permanently damage the nerves there, put drain cleaner in his eyes, and filled his ears with caulk. He also placed needles under Sheldon's fingernails. When workmen were scheduled to come to Bob Berdella's house, he decided to suffocate Sheldon and dissect his corpse before disposing of it. The following June, Robert Berdella committed another brutal murder of one of his runaway acquaintances when he found Mark Wallace attempting to sleep in his shed. Berdella drugged Wallace and subjected him to high-voltage electrical shocks and stuck hypodermic needles into his back. Wallace died after a few days of this unrelenting torture, and his body was also dismembered and disposed of. The next month, Another of Berdella's acquaintances contacted him wondering if he could stay at his house, Walter James Ferris. When Ferris arrived at Berdella's house, he tied him to his bed and tortured him by shocking his genitals with 7,700 volts of electricity for two days until he died from the abuse. The next year, Berdella ran into Todd Stoops, a former male prostitute who had stayed with Berdella in the past at a nearby park. Berdella brought Stoops back to his place to grab lunch. There, Berdella drugged Stoops and kept him trapped in his house for weeks. He attempted to turn Stoops into a submissive sex slave, trying to incapacitate him through electrical shocks to the eyes, and by injecting drain cleaner into his larynx in an unsuccessful effort to render him mute, while repeatedly raping and sexually assaulting him. Stoops eventually died of blood loss after his anal cavity was ruptured by Berdella's fist. In 1987, 
Berdella continued this attempt with 20-year-old Larry Wayne Person, an acquaintance he made while working at his shop. The Kansas City butcher decided to kill him after Pearson jokingly referred to his practice of robbing gay men in Wichita. He drugged Pearson and continued his torture practices aimed at incapacitating his victims, binding, electric shocking, and injecting drain cleaner into his larynx. He also broke one of Pearson's hands with a metal bar. After six weeks of rape and torture, Pearson finally snapped and bit deeply into Berdella's penis during an act of forced fellatio. Berdella then beat and strangled Pearson to death. On March 29, 1988, Berdella abducted his last victim, a 22-year-old male prostitute named Christopher Bryson, who he had solicited for sex. Once he arrived at Berdella's house, he knocked the prostitute unconscious with a metal bar and tied him up. Bryson was subjected to the same torture and abuse methods as Berdella's previous victims. But Bryson knew how to gain Berdella's trust, eventually persuading Berdella to tie his hands in front of him rather than to the bed. Then, when Berdella accidentally left a box of matches in the room, Bryson grabbed them and burned through his ropes, leading to his dramatic escape through the window. After collecting evidence from the house and questioning the suspected killer, Robert Berdella was quickly arrested and charged with the murders of six men. Berdella accepted a deal where he pleaded guilty and revealed everything about the vile murders in exchange for life without parole, avoiding the death penalty. He died of a heart attack while incarcerated at the Missouri State Penitentiary on October 8, 1992, at the age of 43. So ended the life of the Kansas City Butcher, one of the most horrific serial killers in modern history. If you enjoyed the video, please show your support by subscribing and liking the video. And turn on all notifications so you don't miss any future uploads.